Skylar, uh, you know, I realized coming down here, I started as a fourth former in 1961, and then, oh, God, Jock, that was 60 years ago. So, I'm a little surprised that uh, I find myself here. I feel like I should be sitting out there with you guys. And I came from a town just a, a couple hours north of here, Hanover, New Hampshire. That's uh, the home of Dartmouth College. And under that college's influence, I really got into the outdoor stuff. And Eagle Brook was great for that. You know, it had hiking, it had camping, and of course in the winter it had skiing. The person who really ran the ski program um, and the outdoors program was a guy named Bob Easton. And you've seen the Easton name around here. And Bob was old school. He was more into Nordic, cross country and ski jumping than he was into alpine downhill or, cross, uh, downhill or slalom. And if you're on the ski team, you had to do all four events, which meant you had to do slalom maybe a downhill. We definitely had to cross country ski and jump all on the same day. So our intercollegiate, uh, intercollegiate uh, uh, activities were always with all of the events and we called ourselves four eventers. Eagle Brook even featured a large ski jump that Bob Easton built and it was right in front of the Kipling cabin. For cross country skiing, we had a wax room in the basement of the gym and after waxing, we'd have to cross the road and go up near where the swimming pool is now, which is where the trails went out. Now, I will be getting to sharing a couple scenes from that first documentary, Legends of American Skiing, but I want to tell you why I made that film. Having grown up in Hanover, I knew many of the men who actually, actually pioneered alpine skiing. So, um, I was watching as they were passing away and as they were going, so were these stories and, and the whole history of how the sport began. So um, I decided I had to make a film about it and really record their stories. And in the course of my research, I was astounded when I found that Eagle Brook skiing began in 1923. Well, most places at that time only had Nordic skiing jumping and cross country. And in fact, everybody thought skiing was ski jumping. Almost every town had a ski jump. And um, what was really amazing was that Eagle Brook had alpine and Nordic skiing at that early time. And in fact, I've found that Eagle Brook's alpine skiing rivaled Dartmouth as the first school program of its kind to feature this alpine skiing which all goes back to a character named Roger Langley, Eagle Brook's athletic director, who came in the second year of the school. In fact, Eagle Brook, the fact that Eagle Brook even had an athletic director when there were only 25 or so students is just, you know, kind of incredulous. I think what it says is that Howard Gibb, the headmaster, founder, thought that fresh air and a healthy body cultivated a strong mind and a great character. So anyway, he asked Roger to come up with something to do in the winter, a winter sports program. They had no gym, they didn't have any ice, but he had to get the boys outside and Roger chose skiing. And he probably learned a lot from books. Now Roger Langley was never a great skier himself, but he was a great organizer. In this country, in all of America, he played a pivotal role in organizing and seeing that alpine skiing grew. And for this, he was elected into the National Ski Hall of Fame. Now, under him, Eaglebrook joined the National Ski Association. And this organization had been formed really just to regulate ski jumping. And it was it was formed out in the Midwest, and it was run by a bunch of Scandinavians who had settled out in the Midwest until Roger Langley was elected its secretary. And then he went on to become its president and served that role for 12 years, remaining a fixture in the organization for a quarter of a, a century. Now, why am I telling you all this? It's to introduce the first clip 
from that feature PBS documentary, Legends of American Skiing, where you're going to meet Roger Langley. I filmed him at his home over in Barrie, Massachusetts, where the high school is named after him. And we'll meet him as he explains how he got the first Alpine National Championships staged by Dartmouth to be recognized and sanctioned. But I get ahead of myself. We need to set the scene. Before World War I, there was no such thing as alpine skiing. The sport, originating up in the Scandinavian countries, was just Nordic, cross country and jumping. But then, when thousands of Germans and Austrian troops faced off against their counterparts from Italy and France in the Alps in World War I, they had to learn how to get around and how to negotiate the snow on that steep terrain and in all kinds of snow conditions. Hannes Schneider, the so-called father of alpine skiing, came up with a method for teaching the Austrian troops how to ski. And hopefully we'll pick up the film with how alpine skiing then grew. We do need some sound. The stem turn on the Christie. He also favored two poles for greater balance. I am going to put speed into everyone's skiing, he said. It is speed, not touring, that is the lure. Schneider's method of controlled down mountain skiing, his Arlberg technique of a low crouch and swing into the turn, revolutionized the sport. The Norwegian Telemark turn with its upright stance was graceful, but it did not serve a skier's needs on steep or icy mountain slopes. Curiously, the British originated the modern racing events of downhill and slalom. A small but wealthy band of Englishmen traveled to Switzerland to enjoy alpine sunshine. The more adventurous tobogganed and began to ski around the turn of the century. A system of proficiency tests was organized to judge a skier's ability to perform specific maneuvers. In 1922, Arnold Lunn, later knighted for his service to skiing, set the first slalom in Muren, Switzerland. The excitement of downhill skiing as a sport began to spread to Canada and the United States, and in the outdoor traditions of McGill University and Dartmouth College, it would find enthusiastic support. It's hard to tell you how it was in uh, Dartmouth at that time. At this, uh, <clears throat> the Dartmouth Outing Club, they were the guys that liked to go out on the trails and hike and climb the mountains and stay out in the cabins. And they were the hair shirt people that liked to rough it. And that was sort of a tradition of Dartmouth that uh, you were an outdoor person. That tradition can be traced to Fred Harris, who as an undergraduate wrote to the college newspaper in 1909 proposing that an outing club be formed to sponsor cross-country excursions, jumping meets, and a winter carnival. Five years later, the Dartmouth Outing Club hosted McGill. This initiated intercollegiate ski competition among the eastern colleges, and up until the early 1930s, the outing club featured a winter sports team with Nordic events scored together with snowshoe races and skating. During the summer, trails were cut and huts constructed so that winter ski trips were possible over much of New Hampshire's White Mountains. Charlie Proctor was the mainstay of Dartmouth skiing in the 1920s. The Audi Club promoted skiing very strongly. And of course, the Winter Carnival was a great show. They had the ski jumping was a big deal. And anybody that could ski jump was a big shot, you know, and all that.
In 1927, the Dartmouth Outing Club staged the first downhill competition in North America. And Moose Lock was the first one that I know of. It uh, was really something of a down mountain race. And of course, it wasn't very steep because it was on an old carriage road, but it was very narrow. Charlie Proctor won the race with a time of 21 minutes. <laughs> Seems kind of, for a downhill race, it's kind of long. The vertical drop was pretty good, about 3,000 feet. This film of the downhill races at Musalak was taken to Chicago to help persuade the Nordic-minded National Ski Association to sanction alpine events. Among the Eastern delegation was Roger Langley, later to head this national association for 12 years. I don't think, I can't, as I remember it, I don't think there was any bad feeling about it. The only thing was that the Norwegian group thought it was side play, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, in the same caliber as ski jumping. And of course they, uh, I think they considered more of a, of an offshoot of cross country. In fact, the, it's, it's hard to believe, but that first race, that first national championships could be could, could have been called a cross country race in a way at Mount Musilaki because there wasn't, down, you know, the, uh, there were places there where they, were, they weren't going downhill. <laughs> well, this modest man, Roger Langley, shepherded four U.S. Winter Olympic teams he brought the world championships to Alaska in 1950. And he was our delegate, the United States delegate, and became president of the FIS, the Federation of International Skiing, ensuring that America's role in international skiing would be prominent. So it's very cool and very fitting that you have a ski trail named after Roger Langley. And back to that rudimentary race, um, just think about the fact that everybody first had to get there to Mount Musilak, which in those days was no easy feat. And then they had to climb the mountain all before they could start a race. So uh, they had many hours trying just to get to the uh, start. Now, when I was at Eagle Brook, we were still climbing for every foot we skied down. And um, we'd have to pack the trails out by sidestepping them. While there was a rope tow, it only ran on a very few weekends in the winter and only served the lowest end of the trail system down by the field. Most days, we just walked up the trails with our skis on, packing them out as we climbed and ran gates on a short section of what's now called your nosedive. We're going to look at uh, another quick clip uh, from Legends. This one's just to see how ski lifts evolved. An old Ford tractor, some bailing wire, rope, and a little Yankee ingenuity suddenly offered as advertised, 10 days skiing in three. The first rope tow in the United States was built in Woodstock, Vermont. But the idea came down from an earlier version in Shawbridge, Quebec. The beauty of the rope tow was its simplicity. Almost anybody could build one, and build them they did. America was swept up in a rope tow craze. The longest in the world was built in Gunstock, New Hampshire, and rose an exhausting 3,100 feet. For those whose arms were not made of steel, a variety of rope tow grippers were invented. The rope tow made going up almost as thrilling as going down. And I'll never forget darn darn rope tow. That rope tow was that that was a that was a dangerous thing because it wasn't built properly and it did go through the snow most of the time and you 
you had to pull up about 50 pounds to try to do that and stand up. It was a real challenge. Riding a rope toe back then was almost as hard as climbing. So the search continued for an easier way up. The J or L bar came first. The he and she stick, known today as the T bar, had its advantages. Some contrivances, while unique, were not practical enough to stand the test of time. For example, the Queen Mary. And some, like Cranmore's cars, brought from the New York World's Fair, have endured as a one-of-a-kind lift. Lifts have come a ways. Uh, the chairlift was invented just a few years later, 1936, by engineers of the Union Pacific when they constructed Sun Valley, America's first destination ski resort. But I'm going to jump right into a clip from another film. Uh, as you heard, the name Thrills and Spills. I think that that title speaks for itself. Alpine skiing had little of the glamour it soon acquired. For most skiers, skiing really wasn't all that different than sledding. Sure, it took a little more balance, but both were pretty much straight ahead affairs. Point them down the hill and see what happens. For this lad, the difference is purely academic. The problem was, most people hadn't learned how to turn skis. The early skis were essentially wooden planks with curved tips. Only the most expert skier could make them do anything creative. And the experts were in the Alps, not New England. You could still have a lot of fun with skis. You could hook yourself to a dog. Immediately, one thinks of the greater thrill that might be had behind a stronger, fleeter animal. And then, someone comes up with an even brighter idea. The impulses that led to extreme skiing have apparently always been with us. A perfect day for flying. you can see um, with this equipment and the th idea of getting out there and getting a thrill uh, in those old days, um, there were a lot of broken legs, and, and, you know, and other accidents. So um, one who saw a need to do something about this was our own Roger Langley, who was instrumental in organizing a national ski patrol. And he was so influential and important that he was given patrol, the badge Patrolman Number One, the first certified American ski patroller. So I made a documentary about the National Ski Patrol called Ski Sentinels, and I think they tell us that there's 30,000 members wearing badges. So the badge number issued this year would be number 30,001 or something. But Roger Langley was number one. Let's watch some Ski Sentinels. As the National Ski Patrol celebrates its 70th anniversary, it has 10 divisions with more than 26,000 members, serving at over 400 ski areas. While much has changed, the mission and foundations of this organization remain as solid bedrock for the future. But where did it all come from?
The idea of evacuating injured people using a toboggan has many examples throughout history, but in modern times is most traceable to the evacuation of wounded troops in mountainous areas. During World War I, the basis for modern alpine skiing emerged from extensive fighting on skis in the Alps. After World War I, alpine skiing continued to evolve in mountain villages like St. Anton in Austria, Chamonix, France, and at Mürren in Switzerland. Soon, downhill skiing was the most dominant winter sport in the Alps. The sport was brought to North America by European instructors and those Americans who could afford to winter in Europe. Roland Palmedo, a New York investment banker, was one who spent many winters skiing in the Alps. While in Davos, Switzerland, he was impressed when he witnessed the Parsendienst, a Swiss Army ski unit, bring a stricken skier off the Parsen Glacier. Together with friends in 1931, Palmedo formed one of America's first alpine ski clubs, the Amateur Ski Club of New York. By the mid-1930s, there were dozens of alpine ski clubs. Ski trains provided easy access to mountains for thousands, and rope toes dragged them up the slopes. As more and more people tried skiing, it became apparent that first aid and care was needed for the injured. In 1934, at the urging of Roland Palmetto, the Mount Mansfield Ski Club formed a safety committee. Within a year, they had a patrol of club volunteers who had completed the Red Cross first aid course. It was all modeled upon the Parsen daily patrol that Palmetto had seen in Switzerland. Who really were the first patrollers? Who had the first ski patrol? Uh, and uh, and, and the, the claims range as far west as Mount Hood, uh, and in the east, uh, the, uh, the Otter Patrol who serve at Pico. Uh, you've got folks around the Gore uh, mountain area. The Schenectady Winter Sports Club operated snow trains to North Creek, New York. Their first aid committee made up 10 first aid kits and assigned them to competent skiers who were required to take first aid training from the Schenectady chapter of the National Red Cross. On Oregon's Mount Hood, Hank Lewis declared that he was the patrol, recalling, I supplied my own equipment, borrowed an old roll-nose toboggan from the Y East cabin, and took a first aid course in Portland. The Mount Hood Ski Patrol was formally organized in the spring of 1938. I don't think anybody wants that claim of who might have been first ever to be definitively defined because we have such great history and that kind of debate is kind of a friendly debate. I've never heard it elevated to anything but to kind of a friendly discussion of who might have been first. But Charles Minot Dole, Minnie Dole, our founder, is essentially the father of our organization. My name is Charles Minot Dole, Jr., known as Mint. I am the son of Charles Minot Dole, better known as many in the ski world and in the 10th Mountain Division. As my father observed in his book, Adventures in Skiing, I do not think there were patrols, as we came to know them later, but groups of interested local citizens willing to spot locate toboggans and be around weekends to assist any injured skiers to safety. My dad was a member of Roland's Amateur Ski Club and broke his ankle skiing with his fellow club member, Frank Edson, up at Stowe over New Year's in 1936. As he later wrote, when you injured something in those days, you were strictly on your own. Ironically, Stowe had a rudimentary ski patrol organized by Roland Palmetto, but was not set up to spot accidents. It merely had a few willing souls who were around. Stranded up on Mount Mansfield's toll road with a cold drizzle settling in, Dole was relieved when finally his wife and skiing companions, the Edsons, returned with a piece of tin roofing and an extra set of hands to haul him off the mountain. Many was still on crutches when he heard that his friend Frank Edson was killed, racing for their ski club on an icy ghost trail near Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Shocked by the fatal accident, the club's board of governors convened the next day, and Roland Palmetto asked Minnie Dole, as Frank Edson's best friend, to head a safety committee to study the causes and preventions of ski accidents. Well, um, 
despite that sobering reflection on snowy accidents, I'm here offering up this ski history with high hopes and wishes for you for a snowy winter this year. Um, with that in mind, let's watch some passion for snow, remembering our own Eagle Brook ski heritage rivals that of Dartmouth. <laughs> Ever wonder where Dr. Seuss got the inspiration for the Grinch's wild wintry ride from his mountaintop lair to the valley below? Maybe it came from his imagination, but more likely it was based on a place. Beginning with John Carlton, the first American-born Winter Olympic skier, and through the 2010 Winter Olympics, over 100 Dartmouth skiers have qualified for Olympic teams. They've accumulated over 250 individual collegiate, national, and international championships. Many of these heroes have become the role models, the initiators and the facilitators, the innovators and the inventors that have shaped skiing and snowboarding as we know it today. Why? because they have a passion for snow. This guy is really trying to blast his horse. I'll tell you, Tim, he is fearless and he is taking an aggressive line everywhere he can. My plan was to, to continue with the US ski team and go to school at Dartmouth at the same time. I really credit Dartmouth for, for being the reason that I've, I've been able to, to stay on the US ski team. You can see how steady her upper body is, just makes it look so easy and going The Dartmouth so Skiway fast. was the reason I began freestyle skiing. The Ford Sayer skiing program that's offered after school skiing on Wednesday afternoon. It took just a few weeks of training there and I was hooked and I've been doing the sport ever since. Though the 1940 Olympic team was arguably the greatest assembly of skiing talent from Dartmouth to be named to an Olympic team, they did not compete. The Olympics were canceled with the advent of the war. Rather than Olympic medals, these talented, courageous men earned medals of another sort, medals of honor. Walter Parker was inducted sometime during the winter of 41. I had graduated in 1940. If I got a chance to go to officer training, why not? And hopefully I'll get, I'll get into the tenth from there, which I did. They got into the mountain troops to put it to a test And everywhere they went they gave their war oh, About 120 Dartmouth students and faculty were recruited for the 10th Mountain Division. Dartmouth was the single largest contributor of manpower to the U.S. skiing troops and filled many of the leadership positions. We learned military skiing, which is basically the snow plow, the stem turn because you're carrying 90 pounds of rucksack. No longer gives his war hoop, for you can give me skis and some rolls and twister and let me ski way up on It doesn't become real until you go to the front. We had fixed bayonets and that's cold steel, baby. That means you may get close to the enemy. You may have to gut them. Uh, you know, so you're not feeling too happy about this. Tom Corcoran attended Dartmouth during what is often called the ski team's golden years. The guys that were on the team with me, and this was in the early 50s through the mid 50s and going into the later 50s, uh, were Bill Beck, uh, who was the uh, best downhiller that the United States had, fifth in the Olympics, fifth in the Arbor Kandar. And uh, obviously, uh, Ralph Miller, uh, Brookie Dodge, who got a fifth in the slalom in 56. Brookie, student up at Dartmouth College. And uh, Chick Agaya was really the best skier of our generation to go to Dartmouth, skied for Japan. Corcoran was but one example of how a Dartmouth education combined with exceptional talent as a skier, led to not just a job, but an influential career in the ski industry. 
Not every ski resort focuses on alpine skiing. The Trapp Family Lodge in Stowe, Vermont was the first destination Nordic skiing resort in the United States. You know, I always knew when I grew up that I would come back to the family business. You haven't grown uh, up yet. Or I, yeah, well, and I'll, and I'll come fully into the business one of these days. <laughs> but in the, uh, in the meantime, my dad really encouraged me after Dartmouth to, to do something fun, to get out, have my own experiences. And uh, I think it was a great idea to do that while I was young, do that while my knees were young, while my back was strong. And I uh, had a lot of great adventures. And my dad uh, started to call me up and say, when are you going to come back and help out? If I remember correctly, I said, Sam, if you don't come home soon, I'm going to sell the place. <laughs> they talk about Dartmouth and the, the, the granite of New Hampshire, Hampshire in our brains while well, skiing's in our souls. And the granite of New Hampshire in their muscles and their brains. The mountains in general, whether it's climbing or snowboarding or hiking, that's what we do. We enjoy the outdoors. I think my father's most important contribution to skiing is to say that we could be world-class. He could compete with the world-class competitors and then he brought them, invited them, and got them to come to Aspen where they saw they had mountains that were world-class mountains for skiing. So he put skiing on the world map. But I think his greater contribution to skiing was sharing through developing these mountains his love for the sport of skiing, which he then carried through his photographs and his films. Roger Brown and Barry Corbett were among the many generations of Dartmouth skiers to contribute in significant ways to the visual portrayal of skiing, with such films as Ski the Outer Limits. You want the slow motion story? Oh, that's a great story. As we got into shooting stuff with the freestyle guys, uh, particularly the aerial acrobatics, then it was perfect because we could hang them up in the air forever. 16 seconds of screen time for one second of action. And so we introduced that. The forms are many and varied. The purpose is free expression and the declaration of new limits. It seems that skiers at Dartmouth feel part of a bigger family, propelled by a force. Or maybe they're just a little bit crazy. After all, snow will do that to you after a while. Okay, um, I have to mention that on top of everything else he did, Roger Langley did play a leading role in the creation of that 10th Mountain Division that fought in World War II and more recently in the mountains of Afghanistan. Now, I know my presentation has been ski-centric this evening, and I do thank Eagle Brook and Bob Easton for giving me such an appreciation of the outdoors and winter sports. But I also want to share another legacy that my days at Eagle Brook offered. And that's the friendships that were formed here. Remarkably, after 60 years, I'm still in touch with the three roommates I came to in that fourth form year. In fact, most of our class of 64 stays in touch, and most of them came back for the 50th reunion. So treasure your camaraderie with each other, because it can last a lifetime. And, um, even though this has been pretty ski-centric, I've done a lot of other films besides ski films. And um, I'm going to close by showing you a few minutes from my latest film about someone I met when I made Legends of American Skiing because of his passion for snow. But he was famous for a great deal more, as you'll see. And his career spanned the 20th century and really gave us broadcast journalism as we know it. 
This was a drone strike. 55 million people. That's now passing on the president's willingness to testify under... Shake up at Uber. U.S. military... In the heyday of the three network dominance of news, you had a deadline once a day. Then, with the advent of satellites and, and cable, it's a deadline every hour. Now, with the advent of the internet, it's a deadline every second. The web never stops, and the world never sleeps entirely. By and large, people get their news off the little instruments, off the iPhone or off an iPad or social media. The beginnings of this connected, instantaneous world can be found in the work and life of a man you may never have heard of. Lowell Thomas, in many ways, was a founder of electronic journalism as we know it. I grew up out in the middle of South Dakota, a small town, didn't have television, but we had Lowell Thomas. In the 1930s, Lowell Thomas hosted the most listened to radio newscast and the most popular newsreel, bringing the news of the world to Americans. Journalism was transformed as for the first time Americans shared the same news at the same time. The intimacy of the radio, of hearing a Lowell Thomas talk about faraway places with strange sounding names, radio took you there. Lowell Thomas reported stories from India, Alaska, Afghanistan, Antarctica, Tibet, Arabia, seemingly everywhere. I wanted to have an adventurous life, and he was the model for that. There was something very Hemingway-esque about Lowell Thomas. He was a great adventurer, but he was also a great storyteller. And wow, what a storyteller he was. 100 years ago, the journalist Lowell Thomas told the story of and created one of the first media superstars, Lawrence of Arabia, still mythic today. And dines out on Lawrence of Arabia for the next decade or so. Uh, I mean, he made that guy. In 1949, as Chinese communist troops prepared to invade Tibet, a journalist took a caravan all the way into the country's otherwise closed capital, Lhasa, where no other American journalist had ever been. There, he met the young Dalai Lama. I was just too young. I was very impressed. The Lord Thomas, the, his voice, very strong voice, and quite a big nose. <laughs> Come to forbidden Tibet at once. The voice of a traveler, adventurer, storyteller, and seminal journalist. The first voice ever to command the whole country's attention. He brought the world to America in a way that had never been possible before. He helped America shoulder its new responsibilities in that world. His was the voice of America. Good evening, everybody. And one of the most difficult stories to tell has been the story of conflict in the Middle East. The English, with a force of 150,000, including Indian, Australian, and New Zealand troops, were based out of Egypt and moving north in their campaign against the Ottoman Empire, the Turks, who were allied with Germany. Palestine, where you'd had the capture of Jerusalem, was probably the best story going at that time. So it's a logical place for him to go. It's difficult today to understand what a momentous event, the return of, of uh, Jerusalem to, to Christendom, would have been. As we all know, important events in our lives often come about as the result of something that seemed insignificant at the time, like turning down a street and meeting someone by chance, and then uh, the entire course of our lives has changed, sometimes even the course of history. Well, he had good luck, too. I mean... Lowell Thomas discovers T.E. Lawrence. But it wasn't just good luck. To begin with, he has the ability to sniff out the perfect story. It's only in Jerusalem, according to his own uh, diary, that he hears about Lawrence. He doesn't know about Lawrence till he gets there. Thomas's account suggests rather that they met by accident. That may just be a romantic way of, of expressing what happened. One day on Christian Street in Jerusalem, my saw a number of Arabs coming along, but one of them was blonde and he had blue eyes. He's wearing Arab dress, he has a sword in his belt. <laughs> if anything ever said, there's a story here, that's got to be it, you know. And bear in mind, Thomas wasn't a widely published American journalist at that time. He was actually younger than Lawrence. 
Not only unpublished, Lowell was not connected with any news organization, but he wrote excellent daily accounts. One of the real hidden treasures were these journals that Lowell Thomas kept. And in there you have uh, written his meetings with Lawrence. Reflecting their conversations, for example, Lawrence spoke with quite a bit of pride when he said, I am a dynamiter. Well, T.E. Lawrence is such a complicated character. He was a serving British officer. What he seems to have hoped is that he could somehow square the circle between Arab nationalism and his obligations as a British officer. Colonel T.E. Lawrence, under Allenby's command, was working behind the Turkish lines with the Hashemite princes Faisal and Abdullah, who were leading a revolt of the Arab tribes. Lawrence had helped the Arabs seize the port of Aqaba the previous summer. And as luck would have it, he happened to be in Jerusalem when Thomas arrived there. Their initial meeting in Jerusalem, where there are a few uh, great shots taken on the balcony of the Fast Hotel, in a, a meeting arranged by Ronald Storrs, the military governor of Jerusalem. So Storrs introduces Thomas and Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence encourages Thomas to come out to Arabia to see the, the, the show in action. But then to actually go and to, in effect, embed himself with Lawrence's forces, to be there when Lawrence makes that move forward. That was easier said than done. Thomas not only needed General Allenby's permission, he also needed him to provide transportation to get there. One of the reasons the, the War Office decided to work with Earl Thomas or give him access was because, you know, they were being very pragmatic. He was out there, he had a cameraman with him. He had 11 boxes of equipment that they took into Arabia to film. You've got several different still cameras, the moving picture camera as well. You've also got all the film. There's no Kodak office in Palestine or Jerusalem. Bear in mind, it's really hot and film doesn't respond very well to heat. He's in Arabia for 10 days basically doing an itinerary that Lawrence has set up for him to do. To be part of the story is very impressive. Having the Hejaz armor cars run so he can photograph these. Then there's actually footage of Lawrence of himself with Faisal. So Thomas has an opportunity to photograph Faisal, Alda, Nuri, and a number of the major players in the Arab Revolt. Lowell has always reflected a lifelong yearning for exploration and adventure to far-off places, almost any far-off place. Lowell, how did this yen of yours to travel get started, anyway? Well, I suppose it goes back to the days when I spent my youth on top of a lofty mountain in Colorado. In the distance, we could see one of the most inspiring views in the world, the Sangre de Cristo Range for 150 miles on the horizon. And I always wanted to know what was beyond? And I'm still trying to find out. <laughs> he was an explorer by nature himself. He really always wanted to see what was on the other side of the mountain. I always come back, though, to curiosity. He really wanted to know. And if you really want to know, you have to walk the ground. You have to go there. Lowell Thomas, when he would speak, people automatically would listen. When I met him in the Explorers Club, he had been in some of the tough parts of the world. He would take you to Kathmandu and to you know, exotic places in Africa and Asia and the Middle East. His experience really did give him credibility. That's why Lowell Thomas was so successful telling the story about his explorations on radio and anywhere else he could do it. Let's simply say, so long. Well, I'm going to stand up here and ask uh, you to ask. <laughs> I'll try to get you to answer the questions I'll ask. <laughs> Just try and remember that you're all, uh, look at the person next to you and think about how um, you may remain friends 60 years from this day. <laughs>